Okay, so I will start now the second part of this lecture, which will see the merging between two lines of research which have followed different paths up to now. One line is the one I have already discussed, which is the development of optics since the 17th century. And the other line is the observation and the discovery of magnetic and electric phenomena starting in the 17th century also and developing over the 18th century. These two lines of research will merge in the 19th century into what is known as electromagnetism. So I just will recall a few steps in this uh, discoveries. Uh, the first person I will mention is William Gilbert, who was uh, living at the Elizabethan time in, in England, and who described the forces between magnets and has identified the Earth as a huge magnet influencing the direction of compasses, which were used for navigation. The second person I want to mention is Benjamin Franklin, who was, I think, the first American scientist. He discovered uh, the two forms of electricity, positive and negative electricity, and he uh, discovered also invents the lightning rod uh, to prevent lightning to strike buildings. In fact, Franklin was the ambassador of the American insurgents in Paris, and uh, he was also one of the founding fathers of the American constitution. And he was a also a physicist. I want, of, of course, to quote also Galvani, who studies, studies the physiological effects of electricity on muscles, for example, muscles of frogs. So he discovered what is, is, has been called since then the galvanic, galvanic currents, which is just the electric currents. And at the end of the 18th century, uh, Charles Augustin Coulomb established the laws of electrostatics, expressing the force, which is exerted by two electric charges on one another. He showed that two charges of the same sign repel each other, two uh, for charges of opposite sign attract each other, and the law is given here. The, the force is proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance, which is something which looks like gravitation. In fact, uh, the apparatus that uh, Coulomb used is very similar to the Cavendish torsion pendulum that I described last week uh, for the measurement of the uh, gravitational force. So this was the state of the art at the end of the 18th century. Then at the beginning of the 19th century, things accelerated and uh, the study of electric currents became serious. It was a discovery by Volta of uh, the, bat the first battery producing currents in 1799. And this was a really big event. A, a lot of demonstration with Volta batteries were carried on everywhere in Europe, notably in Paris at the French Academy of Sciences. And at that time it was before uh, Napoleon became emperor. He was the first consul of the French Republic, and he was very much interested in science. In fact, uh, Bonaparte was the first president of the French Academy of Sciences after the revolution, and he was very active, and he attended a demonstration of Volta uh, pile at the uh, Academy, and he decided to found an annual prize for the best experimental work on galvanism in 1801. And I show you here the uh, rapport fait à la classe des sciences physiques, that is a report which has made the class of physical sciences uh, of the academy by Laplace, Coulomb, Bio, and others about the first year. But the first year this, this uh, a prize was going to be awarded. I, I read this report and they decided in the end not to give the prize that year. Uh, 
they quoted a lot of uh, memoirs which had been sent to them, but decided no one deserves a prize. And there was one report which I found very interesting, especially for Italians. It came from a lawyer from the city of Trento, Romagnosi, who described in his memoir how a galvanic current was influencing a, the compass of a, a magnet. In fact, a magnet rotating on a, uh, around uh, an axis. The description was rather obscure. I, nobody knows what happened. This memoir was submitted to the French Academy, but no report was made, no prize was awarded. Nobody talked about it. It has been published in La Gazzetta di Trento in August 1802. And I show you here what you can find on the internet. He described in a very obscure and very uh, qualitative way that there is some effect of a current on a magnet. It was 18 years before uh, Erstedt. So during all this time, nothing happened. And 1820, Erstedt did the experiment which he described clearly, sending a current on a wire with a magnet, either a, a compass either above or below the wire. And when the current was established, the magnet, the, the compass was rotating one way or the other. This was big news and the experiment was reproduced everywhere in Europe. Of course, this is also the origin of the galvanometer because by measuring the angle of rotation, you can find out the intensity of the current running into the wire. In Paris, Ampère, who was a professor at Collège de France, decided to redo the experiment and he uh, studied in details the forces acting between two parallel wires. He found that uh, two parallel wires of current attract each other with a force which is proportional to the current. Since you have two currents, it's I squared, inversely proportional to the distance. And uh, this force of attraction is used to define the ampere. The, uh, the ampere, the unit of current, is a current such that if two wires carry it at a distance of one meter, the force per meter on each one is 210 minus seven Newton. So this is a definition of the ampere, which stands stood until last year or two years ago, where it has been defined in a different way using uh, atomic physics and quantum physics. So uh, Ampere did such precise experiments. You see Ka here is a constant, which allows to compute this in, in uh, coherent units. It's called the Ampere constant. And we see that it's, it, it has a connection with the Coulomb constant, which occurs in the law of electrostatics. Now, the physicists were puzzled when they saw that because you see that the force is not along the current. The force is at right angle from the current. And this is the first time in physics that this kind of force occurred, the force which is not directed towards the source which produces the force, but at an angle. And for that, you had to define uh, a new geometrical quantity, which is the cross product of vectors. And so the cross products of vector enter into physics to try to explain and understand the properties of magnetism. The French physicists Bureau and Savard, who were also at Collège de France, established the law giving the magnetic field produced by an element of circuit, DL, carrying a current at a distance defined by the vector R, the current being I. So I show you here the formula. The elementary field produced by an element of circuit at distance r is given by this cross product. And I remind you the rule of cross products. If you have two vectors, the cross product is orthogonal to the plane of the two vectors and has an amplitude proportional to the sine of the angle. That is, it is zero if the two vectors are parallel and it is maximum if the two vectors are at right angle. You also have the rule that a dot a cross b is equal to minus b cross a. So it's the cross product anti-commute. I also want to 
say that the, the sign for the cross product is just a cross in the English literature, and they say it's an upside V in the French. I don't know how it is in Italy, but sometimes I use a cross and sometimes I use the inverted V, but it's the same thing. Now, another important law is a Laplace law, which gives, as you can see, the force acting on an element of circuit submitted to a magnetic field. And again, you have the cross product, which means that the force is orthogonal to the direction of the circuit element and to the magnetic field, and it's proportional to the current I. So this is Laplace law, which is related to the Bure and Savard law. And if you integrate these expressions along circuit lines, uh, you can and Ampere could calculate the magnetic fields which are created by any shape of DC current and the resultant forces and torques that two arbitrary circuits exert on each other. Just a question of mathematics, you just have to integrate these forces over the circuit. For instance, here I show you the magnetic field produced by a wire, a, a linear wire. The field is rotating around the wire and the amplitude of the magnetic field is Ka, where K, K is the ampere constant I over R. Now, if you take this formula and if you compute the circulation of the magnetic field along the circle, since DL is uh, integrated by two pi R, you get that uh, the circulation is just two pi ki. And in order not to have two pi in formulas, you decide that two pi k is equal to mu naught, the constant of magnetism, and you get mu naught i. So what Ampere showed, the, the circulation of the magnetic field around a loop is mu naught times the current going across the loop. And he was able to generalize this to any shape of circuit and any kind of current. And you find this general formula, the circulation of the magnetic field around an arbitrary loop is equal to the sum of the current crossing the loop, which is algebraic. If the current is going in the opposite direction, you have to change the sign. So these are Ampere's results. And he also studied in detail the magnetic properties of a circular loop of current. And what he showed, he computed the force, magnetic force. Suppose that you put this circuit, circular loop into a magnetic field. What is the force acting on it? First of all, the force is zero because if you take two point two elements of circuit which are which are opposed, diametrically opposed, the forces cancel each other. So there is no net force, but there is a torque. The torque which is acting and which makes this magnet this circuit rotate is given by the formula that you should see here. <clears throat> the torque is the cross product of the magnetic moment times the magnetic field. And the magnetic moment is just the area. It's a vector which is normal to the circuit and whose magnitude is I time the surface of the loop. And using this magnetic, this formula, Ampere showed that this circuit has exactly the same effect as a magnet, which is oriented along, along N. The magnetic field of the loop is the same as the magnetic field of the magnet. The torque acting on, the, on this loop is the same as the torque acting on a magnet in a magnetic field. And this kind of analogy, this, this formula, made him conclude that magnets, inside magnets, you had microscopic loops of current, which produce the magnetism. And in fact, this was an early description of what really happens in matter. Of course, you have to quantize matter. The, the currents are described by quantum mechanics, but indeed, this is the motion of the electrons and the spins of the electrons in the materials, which give rise to magnetism. And Ampere had this intuition back in the 1820s, 1830s. He also studied the magnetic field produced by a solenoid. A solenoid is just a winding of, of uh, wires around a cylinder. And he found that such a solenoid had the same magnetic field as a magnet bar, that two solenoids attracted or repelled each other like magnets. 
and he gave this formula. So this was, uh, these results were obtained in the 1820s and then came Faraday in England. Faraday extended this study to, up to now the study was restricted to stat magnetostatics, what happens with DC currents, what happens with fixed charges, what Faraday started to study is what happens if the current varies, what happens if the magnet is moving in presence of, of currents. And he established the laws of induction. You see here that what I stated here is that uh, Faraday discovered that a transient current appears in a closed circuit in three different circumstances. First of all, when the magnet is moved in the vicinity of the circuit. This is the opposite of Hersted law. Hersted has shown that if you send a current, the magnet turns. What Faraday found is that if you move the magnet, the current starts in the circuit. The second circumstance is when another current carrying circuit is moved or has its current changed in its vicinity. And this is the experiment which is shown here, which is uh, coming from one of Faraday's papers. You have a solenoid here which is connected to a galvanometer and you move another solenoid which is receives its current from this Volta battery. When you move the solenoid inside the big one, a current appears. So this is induction. And this is the second way that a time dependent field produces a current. And the third way is even different. Intensity, even if, uh, no magnet is moved. Uh, if the circuit is altered in shape in the presence of a motionless magnet or another current current, something happens. If you have a fixed magnet, but you just change the shape of the circuit, then you get a current in the circuit. So what, uh, what are the quantitative laws of this phenomenon? You see here the case one and two mean that if you have a closed circuit and if you move magnetic field, the flux of the magnetic field across the circuit changes. And then you have an electromotor electro electro force which pulls the, part the charged particle in the circuit. And quantitatively, it is expressed by this formula. The circulation of the electromotive force around the circuit, which has the dimension of the voltage, is equal to the flux of the variation of the magnetic field across the loop. And there is a minus sign, which means that the current which appears tends to oppose to the change. For instance, if you have a solenoid and if you drop a magnet across the, a solenoid which is connected to, uh, to, to a galvanometer, you see that the current appears which have a tendency to slow down the falling of the solenoid in, in the first circuit. So this is the law of induction, which is given by this formula. Now, I want to stress that the third example that I took is rather different because in the frame, in the reference frame of the observer, the magnetic field does not change. The magnet is not moving. What is moving is a circuit, which means that in the circuit, the charges appear as currents for the observer. And this current is submitted to the Laplace force. And so the charges start moving. So this, this is a kind of uh, analogy which struck Einstein. Einstein found that depending upon the observer, you describe the same phenomena in different ways. And as we will see later, depending on the observer, what is an electric field for one observer becomes a combination of electric and magnetic field for another one. And this kind of consideration led him towards the theory of relativity. So you had this, uh, these laws. And what is very interesting is that during all these years, Faraday and Ampere exchanged a lot of letters discussing this phenomena and trying to understand what was really going on. What uh, Faraday did is to introduce the concept of field in physics. Uh, I show you here what happens when you have a magnet, you put on, on top of the magnet a piece of paper 
a sheet of paper and you put some small particles of uh, uh, small uh, uh, iron fillings. So pieces of uh, like uh, small needles of iron which get magnetized by, by the magnetic field of the magnet and which get oriented along the magnetic lines. And in this way, you visualize the magnetic field as, as, which is tangent at each point with the findings. And you get this kind of picture, this kind of picture which shows clearly that the magnetic field lines go in, in loops. The loops close themselves in, on top of the magnet and make big loops outside. You can do the same kind of experiment with electric field. You take a positive and a negative charge or a positive and negative pole, and you immerse this in a liquid and you have small uh, pieces or pieces of dust or pieces of uh, semolina which get electrified and you get the same kind of picture with uh, for electric field. But you see that the, what you get is quite different. All the lines are going out of a positive pole and inside the negative one. And you see now that the pin lines are oriented in the same direction between the poles and outside, whereas here it's the opposite. So the magnetic field lines are making loops and the electric field lines are diverging from one pole and converging to the other. And this difference in properties is reflected mathematically by a mathematical notion, which we call the divergence of the field. A field, in fact, I, I will describe this in more detail on the next slide, but the field, a property of the field is the flux of the field across a close a surface closing a volume. If the field lines are going out, the flux is positive. If the field lines are going in, the flux is negative. And in some cases, the positive part of the flux is compensated by the negative one and the flux across the volume is zero. For electric fields, you see that the flux can be positive or negative, whereas for magnetic fields, the flux across a closed surface is always equal to zero. So this, this is the kind of thing that Faraday saw in a very qualitative way. But Faraday was a self-taught scientist and he had no notion of mathematics and he did not go much further. In fact, the theory of this flux and the difference between electric and magnetic fields was formulated by Gauss in the, in the mid of the 19th century. And I will try to discuss that on the next slide. You see here, for example, what happens for the electric field. You have to define a quantity which is called the divergence of the field. To, include, to define the divergence, what you have to do is to introduce first the gradient operator. The gradient is just an operator which derivate the quantity along with respect to x, y, or z. And the derivation over x is multiplied by the unit vector ex. The derivation with respect to y is multiplied by the unit vector ey and so on. If you take the gradient operator and take the scalar product with the electric field, you get dx of dx over dx plus dy over dy plus dz over dz. This quantity is called the divergence of the field. It's a scalar, it's, a, it's a just a scalar quantity, which is a divergence of the field. And the Gauss theorem states that the flux of the field across the surface which limits a volume, the flux of the field is equal to the integral of the divergence inside the volume. And the flux is defined in the way which I've shown here. If you, you take an element of surface Vs, you multiply it by the projection of the field of the normal, and you get the elementary flux, and then you integrate over the volume and you get the total flux. And this flux is equal to the divergence of the field. And what Coulomb's law says is that this divergence is equal to the charge density with, with one over epsilon naught constant, epsilon naught be related to the Coulomb constant Casey. So I give you here an example 
you have a distribution of charges inside the red volume. You see the field inside is decreasing, is starting from zero and increasing when you get away from the center. And then when you reach the boundary here, the field decreases as one over R squared. So you get a field which is increasing inside and decreasing outside. And now look at the flux. If you take now some volumes which are inside the charge or on the boundary, the flux across this volume are non zero because there is a charge inside. And you see, this means that the field which comes in is smaller than the field which comes out, and you get a non zero flux. On the other hand, if you take a volume which is completely outside, then the divergence is zero, and you get a flux which is zero, which is neither entering nor getting out. So, and this is shown mathematically by, by this expression. The flux is the integral on the surface of this, which is the integral on the volume of the divergence, and which is just Q, the charge of the epsilon. This is the statement of Coulomb's rule. So this is what happens for electric fields. What happens now for magnetic fields? The magnetic field is going in loops. There is no magnetic monopoles. And if you look now at any volume which is crossing this, the flux is always zero. So the magnetic flux across the closed volume is zero, which means that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero dbx over dx plus dby over dy plus dbz over dz is equal to zero. This is Gauss law for a magnetic field. So I introduced here one important property of the field, which is its divergence. There is another property which is related to magnetic field effects, which is a curl. And the curl is just the cross product of the gradient operator with the field. And I defined the cross product already. So I will give you one very simple example. What is the velocity field of a solid object? Take an object which is rotating around an axis. The velocity of each point is of course proportional to the distance to the axis and it's a tangent motion. And you can see immediately that the vector can be defined this way. Vx is equal to minus omega y Vy is equal to plus omega x and Vz is equal to zero. You can define this velocity in this way. And from there, you can compute the cross product of the gradient with V, which is called the curl of V. And I let you do the calculation. You find very easily that the curl is two omega easy. So if you take a, a, a velocity field in a plane, the curl of this velocity field is a vector orthogonal to the plane whose amplitude is twice the angular velocity omega. So this is a very simple calculation. And from then, this illustrates in a very simple way something which is analogous to Gauss theorem, but it's called the Stokes theorem, which relates the circulation of a field to the flux of its curl across a surface which is limited by the circuit. And you see here the expression of the Stokes theorem. You have a velocity field and you want to compute its circulation around the curve C. This circulation is equal to the flux of the curl of the field across a surface, which any, any kind of surface which accepts C as a limit. And you, show here, you see here that it works for the example I took here. The circulation of the velocity omega r times 2 pi r is indeed equal to 2 omega times the surface pi r squared. So this is the Stokes theorem. And I took this example for a very simple uh, field, which is the field of the velocity field of a rotating object. But you can do the same for the magnetic field. and Let's go back to Ampere's theorem and try to express Ampere's theorem in this way. I have shown you here a section of a cylindrical wire 
which carries a current which is normal to the figure. The current density is J, and the current I is just pi R naught squared J. Pi R naught is just a surface of the section of the wire. R naught is the radius of the wire, so pi R naught square J is just the current I. Now, what is the magnetic field inside the wire? Inside the wire, the magnetic field is rotating with an amplitude which is proportional to R. So at the center, the field is zero. And when you go away from the center inside the wire, you get a field which is exactly like the field I had for the velocity. And if you apply the same formula, you find that the field inside the wire is equal to proportional to J, R, and when you put all the figure, you find mu naught J R over two. You have a field magnetic field circulating around proportional to R. This happens up to R equal R zero. What happens for R larger than R zero? What we have seen on previous slide, then the field decreases as one over R outside. So it increases as R inside and decreases as one over R outside. And you have, of course, to find uh, the, uh, what happens by continuity. So you have to write to, to get the constant K, which is expresses B as K over R. You just write the value of the field for R equal R naught. And you find, of course, I, J times R naught squared, you find the current I, you find the value of the field, which give you the constant K. And you find that outside the field is given by U not I over two pi R, which is exactly the formula I gave you before for the Ampere's loop. So you find the way it works, but this, this slide shows you that in fact, the curl of B is J. Exactly like on the left, the curl of B was two omega. So the curl of the magnetic field inside the wire is proportional to J. And the curl of the magnetic field outside the wire is zero. And you can, I let you do that as an exercise. You can find if you express the magnetic field outside the wire, a radial a tangent field which rotates with an amplitude equal to one over R, you compute the curl and you find zero. What does it mean? It means that if you increase the radius, the, the, the circulation does not change. The field decreases as one over R, but the circumference increases as R and the product does not change, which means that the flux of B across this corona is zero, which means that the curl of B is zero. And you find it by doing the calculation. So this seems rather long, but this will allow me to come to the end, which is a discussion of Maxwell's equation. What Maxwell did was to just gather what Ampere and Faraday and Gauss had done and try to put them that in a set of equations which describe the electric and magnetic field as a function of the density of charges rho and the density of current G at each point in space. And he wrote for that four equations. In fact, he wrote much more than four equations because he, he did not use the curl and the divergence. But what I will give you here is just a summary in four equations of what Maxwell discovered. So the first two equations are based on the divergence. The first equation is uh, the equation which states the divergence of P is equal to rho over epsilon naught, which is just the Coulomb equation. And epsilon naught is just related to the Coulomb constant. Epsilon is one over four pi Kc, where K was KC is a Coulomb constant. The second equation is the Gauss equation, which just states the divergence of B is zero. And uh, it is a question I discussed on two, two uh, slides ago. Then the third equation states that the curl of E is minus dB over dt. And this is an expression of Faraday's equation using Stokes' law. Faraday equation says that the circulation of E is equal to minus the flux of B. But what we know is that 
the circulation of E must be equal to the curl of E across the surface. So the curl of E is minus dB over dt. So this is Faraday equation. The last equation is connected to Ampere. And you see Ampere's equation says curl of B is equal to mu naught G. Maxwell said there is something wrong with this equation and I will explain you why on the next slide. So Maxwell completed it by adding to the curl of B, not only mu naught G, but epsilon naught mu naught D over DT. In fact, Maxwell's idea was if the curl of E depends on the derivative of B, the curl of B must depend on the derivative of E by symmetry. But there is a more precise explanation for that. And I will discuss it on the next slide. If you write curl of B equal to mu naught G, it's a magnetostatics equation. Why? Because if you take the divergence on both sides, there is a mathematical property which says that the divergence of curl is zero, which means that the divergence of G must be zero. But if the divergence of G is zero, it means that the flux of G across a closed surface is zero, which means that no charge is coming in or out, which is a static situation. If you admit that the field can, that the charges can go out, it means the divergence of G is different from zero, and you must add something to the equation. And what you have to add is shown in the second equation. The conservation of electricity tells you the divergence of G plus zero over DT has to be equal to zero because what is going out corresponds to the change of the charge inside. And this equation expresses the conservation of the charge, which means now that it's quite clear that what you have to add to mu naught G is epsilon naught D over DT because this makes the two sides of this Maxwell Ampere's equation having a zero divergence. So you see that you have to add this and by adding this term, Maxwell invented the electromagnetic field. Because you see that now, you, now that you have this equation, what happens outside charges? Make rho equal j equal zero. What you have is that curl of E is equal to minus dB over dt, and curl of B is equal to minus d over dt. So the variation of one of the field produces the other, and they just feed each other while they propagate in space. And so the rest of this slide is just expressing this in mathematical terms. What you see, what you can do is to take the curl of both sides of the Maxwell Faraday equation. So you take the curl of curl of E and curl of a curl is the gradient of divergence minus the Laplacian. And the Laplacian is D square over dx squared plus d squared over dy squared and so on. So you have this identity. And this is, of course, the d over dt of the curl of b with a minus sign. Now, what you recognize is that you have here the Laplacian. This is the Laplacian. And you see that divergence of e is zero outside charges. If you don't, don't. So this term cancels. And you get Laplacian equal to d over dt of curl of B, but the curl of B is D over DT. So D over DT of curl of E is D square over DT square with the sign. And you get finally this equation. So the Laplacian of E minus epsilon naught mu naught D square over DT square E square equals zero. This equation is well known. It's called the D'Alembert equation. It was, uh, it discussed the propagation, for instance, of a vibration on a string, only one dimension. It's a wave which propagates along the string. It's a wave equation, which was known since the 18th century. So what is the solution of this equation? What you can find very easily that you take any an arbitrary function of T minus Z over V, it obeys this equation, whatever the shape of F in it. Be careful, there is a correction in this slide, I, I, instead of writing this, I wrote Z minus T over V, which is meaningless because it's not even homogeneous. So you have to correct on your slide, it's F of T minus C over V. If the electric field is along X using 
the Maxwell equation, you find that B is along Y and the amplitude of B is one over V, the amplitude of V. So this equation describes the propagation of a field which does not change a pulse, which does not change in shape and which propagates with velocity V. What is the velocity V? It's one, it's one over square root of epsilon naught mu naught. So you, 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 can find, you can figure it, this out by yourself, taking the wave equation of the previous slide. You find that this works. And so Maxwell, I, I read that, in fact, Maxwell was, it was during the summer of 1865 or 1866, and he was working on the, the countryside and he did not have the values of epsilon naught and mu naught. He had to wait until he went back to London he checked with the value of epsilon naught and mu naught, and what he found is that this is the velocity of light. One over square root of epsilon naught mu naught, which were obtained from electrostatic and magnetostatics, gives the velocity of light. And so this is the manuscript which is conserved in, at, the, at the Academy, Royal Academy in London. This is the last three lines that you can, maybe you cannot read them here, but I have translated them here. The agreement of the result. So he found a value of 308,000 kilometers per second, which he compared with Foucault's result, which was only two or three years old, 298. And he said, the agreement of the result seems to show that light and magnetism are affection of the same substance and that light is an electromagnetic perturbation propagating through the field according to electromagnetic load. This is one, I think, one of the most important sentences in, in, in science in general, because it, it makes the connection between electricity, magnetism, and optics, and it predicts new phenomena. And I find this very striking because this happened, I think, in 1865. And this was a fantastic decade because in 1859, Darwin published uh, the, this uh, book on the theory of evolution. And in 1869, Mendeleev published the periodic table of the elements. So during these 10 years from 1869 to 18, 1859 to 1869, physics, biology, and chemistry, the modern physics, biology, and chemistry were born. And in particular with Maxwell's equation. So let's look at the consequences. First, the first thing I want to add here is that once you know the electric and magnetic fields, you need to compute the force acting on them. And then you have to write again the buon savant and the Laplace force with this, with this uh, formalism. And you find, of course, the Lorentz force the force acting on a charge as an electric part, which is Q times the charge, and, and the magnetic part, which is V cross B times the charge. This is called the Lorentz force because it was stated after Maxwell's equation by H. Lorentz in 1870 or something like that. And I want to state that uh, this is written in a form which is not uh, relativistic invariant. The formula is exact, but it's makes E and B appear as playing different roles. We will see next week that it is not the case that in fact, even if you, if you change from a reference frame, E and B get mixed together, but this formula for the force is still valid. So this is one result. From then on, we have to understand other things. First of all, the Maxwell's equation contain a lot of results we have already described in Fresnel theory. The Maxwell's equation are linear, which means that if E1 and E2 are solutions, then any linear combination of E1 and E2 is solution. And this explains interference effect. You can add electric fields, the superpose and the, the superposition and the combination are still solution. One can also show that these equations satisfy the Hoyland's Fresnel principle. That is, you can to compute how the fields propagate, you can assume that you have secondary sources which vibrate, which oscillate with the phase corresponding to the wave prone that you're 
on which they, they appear. And uh, of course, all the result of final theory apply, provided you identify, for example, the electric field of Maxwell's equation with the vibration of the ether of Fresnel theories. The next point is how can you under, use this to understand the reflection and the refraction of light in matter? And this is something like Lorentz, that Lorentz did. Lorentz was a young Dutch physicist who was born around 1850, who learned about Maxwell's equation, and he went on becoming one of the big physicists of the beginning of the 20th century. What Lorentz assumed that inside matter, you have electric charges. These charges are put in vibration by the electromagnetic field. They radiate their field according to Maxwell's equation. And the total field results from the interference of the incident field with the field radiated by the charges. And did that even at the time when the electron was not known. And Lorentz got the Nobel Prize in 1902. And in his uh, Nobel lecture, he said, uh, coming back to the time when he asked himself this question, now what must these particles be like if they can be moved by the pulsating electrical force of a beam of light? The simplest and most obvious answer was they must be electrically charged. And of course, this particle are the electrons. So he assumed the existence of these particles and computed what, what is going on. And I try to summarize this um, at the bottom of this slide. As, let's consider a very thin slab of matter. In this slab of matter, you have electric charges. You have an incident field coming from the left, which puts these charges in motion. They move at the same frequency. They produce a field which interferes in the forward direction with the incident field. So that's all what we need to know. So you have an interference between the incident field and the field radiated by the charges forward. This occurs at the frequency omega and the spatial dependence is defined by the wave vector k equal to omega over c. So what do you expect to see? What uh, Lawrence show, has shown, again, it's useful to think of it in the Fresnel plane. This blue vector is the incident field. This red vector is the field radiated forward by the charges. Of course, this red vector is very, very small if the slab is very thin. But you see that it turns out that this vector is orthogonal to EI, the field radiated forward in a transparent medium is orthogonal to the incident field, which means that the resulting field makes an angle in the final plane, has a different phase. This change of phase reflects the change of velocity of the light inside the slab. And this is what I try to, what I show by the formulas. You see here in complex notation, a plane wave of frequency omega and wave vector k propagating in space. This is the incident field. Here, you, the field that you have to add, the i factor means that the phase difference by pi over two. And this field is proportional to delta z to the thickness of the slab. And eta of omega is just a coefficient which depends upon the structure of the charges, something that you can compute only with quantum mechanics. but you can assume a value for this quantity, which depends on frequency, because the answer of the medium is a function of the frequency of the field. And if you add these two things, you find this expression here, and you find that the field is modified by this factor, E minus I eta omega dz. And you can rewrite this, you can subtract K dz and add K dz. This means that this is a propagation outside the slab, over a distance which is z minus delta z, multiplied by the dephasing produced by the slab. And if you look at the dephasing produced by the slab, it corresponds to an index n of omega, which I have written here. n of omega is one plus eta omega over k. Now you find that this Lorentz theory predicts that the refractive index is a function of omega and uh, that, that 
the phase velocity of light is modified in the medium. And you can show from the on that the velocity of the pulse, which must be a sum of different frequencies, is slowed down in the medium with respect to what happens in vacuum. So I have come here to almost to the conclusion. I just want to summarize what Maxwell had found on this slide. What Maxwell had found is that light is just a small window that you expand here from red to violet in a huge spectrum of electromagnetic waves that you cannot see. Our eye is sensitive only to a window because of between 0.4 and 0.7 micrometer. But at longer wavelengths, you have radio waves. At shorter wavelengths, you have X-rays. And the power of the theory is that it predicts two phenomena. And Maxwell's equation predicted the existence of radio waves and X-rays. And these were discovered about 10 or 20 years later. Of course, you know Hertz discovered microwaves at what end of the spectrum, and uh, Röntgen discovered X-rays. And I don't have to insist on the application, the revolution in technology, which has been brought by the discoveries of these waves in com for communication, for medical diagnosis, and so on. But, and this is also uh, a part of the, the wealth of containing the theory, it opened new questions, new mysteries, which will lead to the revolution of the 20th century. There are some things that classical physics doesn't explain. What is in, a, in, which, in which medium do these electromagnetic waves propagate? So the question of the ether is raised again. And also, what is the spectrum of radiation of heated bodies? How do heated bodies radiate or absorb energy. And this, is, this was summarized in the year 1900 by Lord Kelvin, who made a very famous lecture at the Royal Institution in London. And he started his lecture by saying, the beauty and clearness of the dynamical theory, which asserts that heat and light to be modes of motion is at present obscured by two clouds. One cloud was the puzzle of the ether which I have already alluded to, talking about fields of experiment, which will lead to relativity and to upset the notion of space, time, and gravitation. And the other cloud was known as the ultraviolet catastrophe. The fact that when you use Maxwell's equation and classical thermodynamics, you find out that the energy radiated by heated body is infinite, which is of course absurd. And this second cloud, led to quantum physics by, and introduced finally indeterminism and non-locality in microscopic physics. And to solve these two clouds, there was one person who was absolutely essential, that Albert Einstein, who was of course a father of relativity and one of the fathers of quantum physics. So the next lecture, the third lecture will be about the ether puzzle. And the fourth lecture will be about the ultraviolet catastrophe and the birth of quantum physics. And I will stop here. Thank you very much.